today's training topic is uh, the low income subsidy from Medicare. Uh, what we're really talking about here is creating an SEP uh, in order to do enrollments. I mean, that's the, the real idea behind all of this, but uh, what we'll do is uh, we're gonna help our beneficiaries get the extra help, okay? Uh, with, with Medicare prescription drug cost. And this is gonna provide our uh, beneficiary uh, with, with an SEP. So one of the few things that um, is uh, really always a lot of fun about Medicare is that there are so many different names for the same thing. And in this particular area, uh, we can call it the low income subsidy or we can call it extra help. Uh, it's the same thing, uh, whichever name that you want to use, uh, you'll see it referred to as either one of those. So exactly uh, what is extra help with me uh, Medicare prescription drug costs? Uh, anyone uh, who has Medicare uh, can get uh, you know, Medicare prescription drug coverage. Now, some people with limited resources and incomes may also be able to get extra help uh, with the costs. You know, when I talk about the cost, uh, what I mean here is going to be the monthly premium itself for your uh, uh, PDP, or, you know, your prescription drug plan, or the prescription drug plan portion of an MAPD plan. Uh, the annual deductible, remember that the annual deductible is now $435. Um, and then prescription payment, uh, co-payments uh, uh, when they actually fill the prescription. Uh, it's always gonna depend upon exactly how much you're getting and how much extra help you have. Um, and we'll break that down for you in, in this uh, webinar and kind of kind of take a, a closer look at that. Okay, now extra help is estimated to have a value of about $4,900 a year. So uh, this is significant, uh, especially for people. Uh, there's some big savings here. Uh, and so many don't even know it's even available. Now, uh, we'll go through what it takes to find out if somebody qualifies, uh, what social security is gonna wanna know, and uh, what information uh, the, the customer is uh, literally um, gonna be required to provide, okay? Now, uh, the LIS or extra help is a federal program uh, for Medicare beneficiaries who do have that limited uh, income and resources, like I said, also known uh, as extra help. And you, when, it, when I talk about paying for prescription drug cost, it's really kind of state dependent, uh, but they'll pay, it, it's usually about 30 bucks uh, towards the uh, prescription drug plan or that prescription drug portion of the Advantage uh, plan in MAPD. Now, when it comes to that, it's really gonna depend upon what state uh, the applicant is in. Uh, on the low end is the state of Texas, uh, where they pay about $23. And on the high end is the state of Wisconsin, where they pay about forty dollars. So I always look, use that. Uh, you know, a good average is to say that the state's going to kick in about thirty bucks. Uh, remember that uh, the annual deductible for somebody receiving full extra help is zero, and it's uh, for somebody receiving partial extra help, it could be as much as eighty-nine dollars. Whereas the annual deductible for everybody else is $435. And then we'll look at those prescription co-payments, kind of uh, see exactly what those are and see if, um, if there's any problems or you know, uh, how we can help them there. The uh, other thing that always comes to mind is that remember in Medicare, if you didn't sign up for a prescription drug plan when you were first eligible, uh, there was a penalty and you have to pay that penalty for the entire time that somebody has uh, the, a prescription drug plan. Well, if you do have the extra help, that penalty is waived. They don't have to pay the penalty uh, while they have uh, extra help. Okay. So that's, uh, that's always a, a big plus there also. So Medicare beneficiaries can qualify for extra help with their Medicare prescription drug plan. 
uh, just to qualify, a person must be receiving Medicare, have limited resources and income. And we're going to break down those resources and income uh, a bit more and reside in one of the 50 states or the District of Columbia. Uh, so also notice that it's not good in the territories. So if you live in Puerto Rico, um, you know, they don't have uh, extra help there. So we'll look at the uh, the chart because everything um, is going to be kind of based that starts off with the uh, the federal poverty level. We have all seen this chart and uh, and worked with that. And as we go on, so anyone uh, with Medicare and a Medicare prescription drug coverage. Uh, so what they're going to look at though is where you fall, um, you know, um, on this chart. And I was just uh, looking at this. We'll just start off with looking at, uh, you know, uh, one person in the household. And the key thing on here is look at the one where it says 150% uh, FPL, because you have to be less than that number. Uh, there is no extra help at equals 150%. It's, uh, you know, the number is uh, less than 150% uh, of uh, uh, federal po poverty level. But there's a lot of uh, elderly seniors out there that are raising grandchildren or still have uh, you know children at home. So that number in the household uh, can go up and uh, you know and change where they you know the amount of money that they're allowed to have. So keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, there are so many people living on Social Security. So I kind of I went out there and did a little look about to find out what's, what's the average uh, Social Security check out there. And what you find out that in uh, 2019, uh, the average was uh, about $1,470 a month. While I personally could never uh, figure out how it's even possible to live on that, um, I know that there are many people that are doing that. And what you find is that works out to be about $17,640 a year. So you can see that that is going to be less than that 150% uh, of poverty level. Now, I also know that the average disabled worker and the average uh, widow or widower is making a slightly less than that. So if I look at uh, those who retired on that, uh, while well, even though I think it's next to impossible, as it turns out, 23% of the married retirees and 43% of the single uh, retirees, that Social Security benefit is over 90% of, um, of, of, of their retirement monthly income. So there's going to be quite a few people out there that are going to be eligible for extra help. Um, and they don't even have any idea about it. They've most likely never even uh, heard of the program. So uh, we're going to try to uh, ask this question and what worked best for me, and I'll explain how I came up with the number, was I would always ask is, your income less than about $1,200 a month. And the reason I use that $1,200 a month is because when we see that that monthly benefit is around $1,470, uh, okay, uh, that Part A has not been deducted from that number. And they're not getting that Part A number, but it is uh, in the income that is going to be counted. So if I looked at their Social Security award letter, I would see that they are uh, getting, you know, that money as far as Social Security is concerned, even though they're using it to pay for their uh, their Part B premium. Uh, so that if you subtract that out of the, uh, you know, the 1470, it takes you down into, I think it's around uh, 1221. And in there, anyway, I always... Uh, like like to just ask the question that way at, at the 1200 and that way I could kind of uh, get a, a good feel you know it's like oh no I make a lot more than that and I also go oh no I don't make that much 
Okay, so those are uh, so just just a good number to use there, and it'll help you um, to kind of see what you're working with. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about um, how it works. Okay, you know you can have a different you know the, the various subsidy categories. Uh, there's you know those that are institutionalized, those are living in nursing homes or using uh, some kind of uh, home or community-based services like PACE or something like that. We're not dealing with those. We're looking at the ones that are like a full benefit, dual eligible. That would be probably maybe somebody that's medi medi, maybe not, uh, but they are receiving extra help at uh, the equal to 100% of federal poverty level. Uh, they have a zero deductible, so right off the bat, they're saving uh, you know the, the $435. Uh, they're going to have a co-payment, and it doesn't matter what drugs they're taking. It's all about, uh, and it doesn't matter what tiers they fall under. Okay, if it is generic, their cost is $1.30. If it's a brand name drug, it's $3.90. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I want you to think about, though, is that uh, sometimes they may not know if they have extra help, but we can ask the question about what they're paying for the drugs. And if that's what they're paying, you'd know that they have extra help that way also. Okay. So then they got, you know, uh, and once that cost, uh, you know, goes over, uh, the 6,350, which is uh, where you go into catastrophic coverage on a prescription drug plan, they would pay zero uh, for any prescriptions after that. So one of the other things that uh, you need to keep in mind is that that prescription must be covered uh, by the prescription drug plan. Okay, so. Uh, when I'm telling you that the cost would be $1.30 for generic and $3 for 90, the assumption is that the prescription is covered by that plan. If it's not a drug covered by the plan, uh, then uh, you know all bets are off. Nobody's uh, getting any money to help cover that. Now, if it's a full benefit, uh, dual eligible, you know they're greater than 100%, but they're less than uh, 135%. They're still getting, you know, the full benefit of extra help. They're still zero deductible, but uh, their cost on the generic max is now at $3.60, and their cost on the brand name max is at $8.95, and it still goes to zero once they reach catastrophic coverage and somebody who's only getting partial extra help, okay? So they're less than 150%. You can see that their deductible dropped down to $89. The co-payment, uh, which was 25%, is now 15. And once they go into catastrophic coverage, they get the $3.60 for generic and $8.95 uh, for uh, a brand name. You know, I mean, that's all... Uh, uh, fine and good to kind of look at there, uh, but let's kind of give you an example, and I'll give you some some real numbers here. Uh, I was looking at uh, Humalog. It's a diabetic insulin. It's a name brand. It seems like most of the people I've ever dealt with that were using insulin, it was either Humalog or Novolog, uh, two very similar drugs. Usually, um, uh, one's covered as a tier three in a drug plan, and the other one's covered at tier four. I, uh, one would be the preferred and one would not. So let's just uh, use the example of their on uh, full extra help, okay? So we see the retail cost is, uh, you know, $553. Um, by the way, I did see that if I was able to use something like, uh, you know, good RX, I can actually uh, get that cost down to about 327, but that doesn't do somebody any good uh, because now it doesn't count towards their catastrophic uh, out of pocket. Uh, to be able to do that. So we'll just, uh, looking at our example here, so we've got our full extra help person uh, who simply starts off uh, paying, you know, $8.95 uh, until they reach uh, catastrophic coverage, if they ever did, at which time it would go to zero. Okay. Now, the lowest level of uh, extra help 
is that 75%. Uh, so that person, so if I can get you any extra help at all, you can see uh, the cost difference between having it and not having it is pretty significant. Uh, so the deductible dropped down to $89. So we'd see the cost before the deductible at 114. So that's the deductible plus uh, a copayment of $26. It gives you the, uh, the 114. Uh, after the deductible, they're paying $26. Uh, the 15% uh, would be the uh, $48.95, and then again, it drops down to that $8.95 if they get into catastrophic coverage. Somebody with no help at all uh, is going to have to pay the deductible and the first co-payment, so it's uh, probably in January, $461. Then Let's probably spend the rest of the time paying the $26, uh, you know, each month for that prescription. Now, that would be assuming that they had nothing else, no other prescriptions, right? Uh, so if once they did uh, get into the gap business where they're paying uh, the 15%, now you're looking at $138.47. And 27 um, 69 after the coverage gap. So you could see that having anything at all is uh, quite a bit of savings, you know, uh, right off the bat. So if I can help somebody get that, I can truly uh, uh, save them some money. Okay. And let's see. So as we kind of go through here, so uh, Social Security uh, estimates the value of, uh, of having extra help to be about $4,900 a year. So it is uh, you know, a good value for those uh, to qualify. And like I said, so many people don't even know that it's available. So let's look at who's eligible for this. And now some people uh, are gonna automatically qualify and already be on it, okay? And so that's gonna be anybody who receives uh, Medicare and Medicaid together, okay? the medi medis okay? Um, anybody whose Medicare premiums are paid for by the state. So in other words, they're uh, one of those in some sort of a program. They may not be on full Medicaid, but they may be having their Part B, and in some cases, maybe even their Part A paid for uh, by the state. Uh, we'll, we'll go into that uh, probably quite a bit more. I'll give you this, the shameless plug uh, for next month's special needs plan, but we'll uh, dive in a bit into the Medi-Medi program. And you would see um, for most people that get the full Medi-Medi, they're gonna have what they called QRP plus, but uh, somebody who has um, a Medicaid status of QI or qualified individual would be one that's just getting their Part B premium paid. Okay, so what they're saying is, is anybody that falls under that category uh, would automatically be getting the extra help. Okay. And then any beneficiary who has Medicare and is also uh, getting uh, supplemental security income. So that could be somebody under 65 who has uh, a disability or, an, um, or maybe they have one of those uh, diseases that got them uh, you know, onto Medicare early. So who else would be available? Okay. Well, that's what we're gonna uh, try to see if we can qualify some of our customers for this. And what I'm looking at here is, is uh, you know, other beneficiaries may qualify for extra help with Medicare prescription drug costs, and it's gonna be based on uh, income, uh, their resources and assets, and their household size. Because you saw how on the federal poverty chart, uh, having a larger household allows a higher income. So they kind of work hand in hand. And then there is some um, maximums that you can have, things that you can own, resources and assets. Now, it's quite a bit different than it is for Medicaid. And that's why somebody can qualify for extra help, but not qualify for Medicaid. Okay. Uh, is usually going to be not necessarily the income, but probably over on the resource and asset side. Uh, so the beneficiary is going to complete and submit an application, and depending, uh, you know, on their income and assets, they may qualify for uh, full or partial um, 
you know, extra help, and we'll kind of see just how how much um, they're going to be able to get. Now, we're going to look at that application, and one of the things that you're going to find is, is in doing that application, we can help our customers with that, and we can actually do the application on their behalf uh, with them. A third party. Uh, is allowed uh, to do that. You're going to put your name and phone number and all that stuff in there, uh, and I'll show you that uh, in a bit on uh, how to do that extra help application. So if you assist someone with the application, you must uh, you know answer all the questions if, as if that person were completing the application. Uh, so and uh, find out if they're going to be eligible. Social Security is going to want to know. Uh, the value of his or her savings, investments, real estate, other than their home, as well as income. Uh, we're going to need this information about whomever you're helping, uh, about that person and their spouse if they're married and living together. Okay. Now, you can help someone apply for extra help uh, by visiting their website, and we'll go on and take a, a closer look at that. So let's look at these um, income requirements. So we're going to look at uh, you know, wages, uh, social security income, uh, support from other family members. I always uh, found that um, a little bit humorous. I mean, it's like, uh, what do they mean by support from other family members? Uh, because uh, it doesn't count if they're uh, regularly receiving something to help pay for, you know, food, uh, mortgage, rent, heating, fuel, gas, electric, water, property taxes. So I guess uh, if uh, you're, you're you're giving them money to go to the movie, they have to claim it. But uh, if they're using it for support, uh, they don't claim it. Okay, so the limits uh, that they're allowed. Uh, it's going to be if they're an individual, and these are the limits that you see in the chart there are the absolute maximum. You're going to have to, you can't go over that and still qualify. Uh, it doesn't, this, that particular little table does not go into the number of uh, people in the household. So if there's a, a larger household other than just um, the two people, then you know, you'll have to go back to the table. Okay? Also remember that in Alaska and Hawaii, uh, the numbers are a little bit different. These are only for the, uh, you know, the 48 contiguous states and the District of Columbia uh, that are using this. Alaska and Hawaii uh, have uh, their numbers are a little bit different. Now, not everything counts, though, and we want to kind of take a look at that because um, uh, not everything counts as income. If, the, if they're receiving supplemental nutritional assistance uh, program, uh, we normally refer to that as food stamps. Uh, if they're receiving food stamps, uh, that money doesn't count. Uh, if they're getting any kind of housing assistance, that money doesn't count as income. You know, home energy, uh, Money, extra monies that they're given for medical treatment and drugs, disaster assistance, uh, earned income tax credit, um, any assistance from others that's used to pay household uh, expenses uh, doesn't count. Any victims' compensation payments, uh, scholarships and education grants, uh, those are not going to count towards uh, the income. So I would always encourage anybody who's even close um, to apply, okay? So the next one uh, that's also gonna be in there are your resources, uh, resource limits. Uh, so resources and assets are the value of things that you own, okay? Real estate, bank accounts, cash, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, retirement accounts. Um, you know, I mean, those are all pretty simple. I always think of it as something that, uh, you know, can be you know, readily uh, cash as, uh, as what's going to be in included in there. Uh, they do have so, quite a few um, exclusions uh, when it comes to resources also. And so... Uh, the home that you live in, you can own your home and it doesn't matter, okay? So your primary residence uh, doesn't count as a resource. Um, personal possessions, you're allowed to own uh, one vehicle, okay? Uh, that's not gonna be a problem. Uh, 
let's see, anything that you use for support, I mean, that goes on to your income, that could be rental property, or it could be uh, farmland that's used to, uh, you know, grow produce for home consumption. Uh, Non-business property, property, essential to self-report, uh, support. Okay, yeah. Uh, life insurance, burial expenses. Uh, I mean, there's just things in there that, like we were saying, that just don't count as an asset. So uh, you just want to be sure that you you don't count those kinds of items. Okay. So a lot of times, uh, what we want to know is is that person you know uh, already getting extra help uh, maybe they told you that they were only paying you know a buck 30 for uh, you know medications or something like that and uh, they only took uh, you know they didn't take enough that you could really dive in and really see that that made sense uh, well there is a way that you can actually check to see uh, if a person does have extra help and what you're going to need uh, is a couple of things. Uh, one, you have to log in uh, to uh, their account on their on the Medicare website. Everybody uh, can have an account with Medicare now, and uh, if they don't have one, uh, that's the information that you need. You need the you know the zip code, the Medicare number, last name. Uh, part A effective date, you can do it with a Part B effective date also, but Part A or Part B uh, effective date and the customer's date of birth. Or you can, uh, that would be to create an account. Now, we have been asked not to create accounts for our customers. Uh, and I always draw that distinction between assisting our customers setting up their own accounts and setting up accounts for our customers. So we can assist them, but we can't do it for them. So we want them to have that uh, account because it's going to do uh, so much more than just uh, uh, let us know if they have extra help. It's going to also get them a new copy of their uh, their card if they need one. It's going to let them, uh, you know, see the status of uh, claims with Medicare, et cetera. Okay. So uh, you can, uh, like I said, uh, go that route. And once you get in, uh, you Here's how you go and do that. You, this is Medicare.gov's uh, opening uh, website. Okay. Uh, here's when you first go on there, you'll see uh, the the blue boxes there across the top. They go light blue once you, uh, you know, click on one, uh, like like I have there on the uh, the upper left. However, normally that would have been dark blue also, but then it says. Uh, the one that you would click on is a sign up and change plans. And you see the last one there on the bottom says uh, check your enrollment. Okay, so if you click on the check your enrollment, it is going to take you to this screen. Okay, so at this point, I either have to put in a username and password and log in, or I'm going to have to, uh, you know, create an account. So you have to do one or the other. Uh, at that point right there. Oh, but once you go on to the next screen, it's going to look like this. It's just going to say your enrollment status. And the one that we have here for our example, you can see was is enrolled in the Humana Preferred RX plan for a PDP. Uh, is their current plan, and it will state whatever they have. Okay. And then the next one down, it says your current subsidy. Okay. This one has no subsidy. Uh, but it would say full extra help. It would say, uh, you know, uh, Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, it, would, it would tell you exactly uh, what they had uh, as a subsidy there, if there was more than one. Okay, so if we want to see the application, we would go there to that uh, www.ssa, as in Social Security Administration forward slant benefits, forward slant Medicare, forward slant prescription help. You can actually get there with just um, ssa.gov forward slant prescription help. And it, it will take you, uh, you know, to the beginning of the process uh, for enrolling in extra help. You can also uh, call into Medicare and apply over the phone. Uh, 
Now it says that you can uh, request an application. I got that right from uh, you know the wording from the website. However, when you pull uh, the documents and and pull out that application, it basically tells you on there in big bold letters, do not do not complete and submit this. It is not an application. Uh, but what it has is uh, really, I would look at it as a form you could fill out to have all the information in front of you to then go to the website and fill it out there. That website is the preferred method uh, for uh, doing the application. Uh, but you can also uh, have the beneficiary apply in person at the local social security office. Uh, I have always found that place to be an absolute zoo and would be like on the bottom of my list on whether I wanna spend my morning or my afternoon at the uh, social security office because that's what it would uh, wind up with, you know, 10 minutes in front of the counter and uh, three hours of wait. Um, okay, so now after uh, you submit the application, um, you know, you can do a few things here. Uh, I have always wanted to, you know, uh, help them myself do the application. I always uh, wanted to go in and take a look at their account or help them set up an account. Uh, and I want to keep that information because about two weeks, you know, after you have submitted the application, um, you know, and they've had a chance to review it and do that kind of stuff, uh, it's going to show up uh, in its status in about two weeks, about one to two weeks before the letter comes in the mail. I always like to uh, call up the customer and uh, and present, you know, hey, you know, Mr. Smith, I've got some really good news for you. Looks like your extra help has been approved, and then proceed on with uh, with doing some sort of an application. Because I always looked at my goal uh, was to, you know, to get uh, somebody enrolled. Okay. And if uh, that's what I'm uh, trying to do, you know, with that being the ultimate goal. Uh, I want to be able to to do that as soon as as soon as I can. So I wanted to uh, uh, monitor that, and as soon as I saw that uh, I could get the extra help, uh, and it was registering there on uh, uh, Medicare's website, then they're good to go. Because all I'm doing is checking a box on an application that they have extra help, and that's the same information uh, that the carrier is going to see. So it's not like they're gonna get something special. Nobody's ever gonna ask for the letter or anything like that to, get to, to come back, okay? Now, one of the things that you're gonna see on the application is that uh, once they, you get in there, they're gonna to wanna to know if uh, you wanna see about help for um, the state Medicaid program. So it's talking about help with other Medicare costs may be available from the state, under the Medicare Savings Program. And so by completing the extra uh, help application, we'll also start that process uh, for our customer. Uh, they may not qualify for the full Medicaid and be a, you know, a dual, but they may uh, be able to get uh, maybe their Part B premium paid. Okay, so there will be some, uh, you know, some added value there and some savings for the customer. Okay. But uh, the state will contact them. Yeah, let's see here. Let's see additional help. Um, okay, uh, like I said, the uh, the ultimate goal was to enroll somebody in a plan, uh, and the purpose of us helping use the uh, uh, extra help, uh, you know, low income, um, is to try to generate a special election period for the customer so that I can enroll them in something. So if I'm unable to develop, uh, you know, an SEP and complete an enrollment. I still want to lay that groundwork for the next AEP, you know, enroll them now or enroll them later. Of course, my preference is always to enroll them now. Okay. But I also want to, to you know, to show my worth and I want to, to be able to get them into, you know, my program, which I've talked about of, uh, you know, I, you can't expect here in January to attempt to get somebody extra help and maybe they just don't qualify. Uh, but they, uh, uh, but you want to help them with a new plan, but they won't be uh, eligible for that plan until the next AEP. 
you can't talk to them in January and then talk to them again in October and expect them to remember who you are and uh, do an, an enrollment with you. However, if you use uh, my contact system, which I talked about on Monday, uh, will allow that to happen for you. In other words, you're going to uh, keep in contact with them. You're going to be calling them once a quarter, see if anything changed, uh, changed in their situation. Just reemphasize that uh, you know you want to be able to help them and to show uh, that, that you're going to be there for them. Okay, so perhaps you're going to have to use one of these other things to help with a particular prescription they have. That first one there, uh, www.medicare.gov pharmaceutical assistance program. You can look up their prescription and see uh, what the manufacturer has available for them. Okay, what what can be done uh, from the manufacturer? They may be, uh, you know, uh, a low-income program through the manufacturer. Um, there may be free a free program that they can get a part of. Uh, they may be able to get coupons. They may be able to get some kind of a discount, uh, you know, directly from them. But it's going to start with uh, going to that website, looking up uh, the prescription or, you know, the actual drug and see what's available out there. I'm sure you've all seen that commercial uh, for something on television. At the very end, it says, uh, you know, call this number and maybe AstraZeneca can help. Well, they're one of the manufacturers of uh, a large uh, number of prescriptions out there. Um, and they do have programs for that. There was a time prior to uh, uh, 06 and the uh, uh, Part D that just about every state had some sort of pharmaceutical assistance program. Most of those have gone. There's a few programs left out there. There's a few that uh, from different states that'll still cover, uh, you know, regular prescription drug coverage. Uh, there's um, Epic in New York for one that comes to mind. Uh, there's a few for uh, people with, you know, HIV. There's some for those with ESRD uh, that, that assist with those kinds of things. So there are some state pharmaceutical assistance out there still. Uh -huh. I would investigate that depending on where the customer lived. Uh, we talked about some manufacturer coupons, discount programs. You know, there's the ones like, you know, GoodRx. Here's the, the problem. The coupons and the, and the assistance that you can get that will work with your Part D is all going to go towards your catastrophic coverage. Remember the 6350 uh, If you use these discount programs um, or things like uh, a GoodRx, uh, you're outside of your Part D coverage and it won't count. So I'd be careful with that, okay? The, uh, I mean, it can save you money on the prescription. It just won't count towards your catastrophic coverage. The other one that I encourage a lot of people to use is mail order. You know, many of the Part D plans, uh, not all of them, but many of them, will do tier one and tier two generics, 90 day supply, at zero cost through the mail. Okay, so I would also always take a look at uh, helping people, you know, get into that and make sure they understood that, and so that they they do try to uh, to do that. Okay. So what I was going to try to do here is take a look and see if we can uh, get into the uh, pro, you know, where we look at. Uh, the extra help here. Okay, so this is what the uh, extra help looks like. This is the uh, the screen. If you go to uh, uh, the uh, the extra help there at um, you know www.ssa.gov, it'll take you to this page here, and you want to click on where it says apply for extra help with Medicare prescription drugs, okay? So if I go there, uh, it's gonna take me into the, the program. And I'm gonna come down here to the bottom, which uh, uh, just says, this is just gonna ask you all the income questions where it says, find out if you qualify here. I'm in the lower right-hand corner, find out if you qualify. But just go to apply now. Okay, and come to the bottom, it's, uh, next. Okay, uh, we'll go through here just a little ways. It says, you know, who, are you assisting somebody? Yep, we're gonna go in, we're gonna help somebody. It says, uh, 
did you get the application in the mail? Nope. Um, do you have Medicare? Yes. Um, are you over 65? Yep. Well, just say um, we're not on disability or any of that. What state do you live in? Okay, I live in Oregon. And we'll just say single for now. Okay. It says, um, it says, do you have combined savings and investments? No, I do not. Okay. So we just go on. And what you're going to see is it's going to do is it's going to ask, um, uh, it's going to say, okay, go ahead and do the application. Okay. So I'm helping somebody. So I'm the person completing the form. And then this would be the person that you're doing, you know, the applicant's name and who it's for, you know, where they live uh, and all that. And it's, uh, as I'd have to actually fill this on out before I could go on to the next page. But this is the, here at the bottom, you see, uh, do you want to, you're going to be automatically uh, applying for uh, about the Medicare savings program. Uh, unless you say no. And I usually don't recommend that you do that. You're just going to want to go ahead and, um, and and let that happen because uh, if they can qualify, we're just it's just more for them. So what we're at the end of all of this, what we've really developed is an SEP. Okay? And so that's what I want. I want the SEP. The SEP is going to let me make that change, uh, you know, once per quarter for the first three quarters. It's just uh, what we looked at in the uh, the SEPs. But this is a way that uh, through questioning my customer and finding out, um, uh, you know, if I can help them and they don't have an SEP from any other source, this is always a, one of the possibilities that uh, if they do fall under that low income status, uh, that, that maybe they do. You know, as it turns out, uh, you know, for those that are living on social security, that's about 23% of the married couples and 43% of single people, uh, social security provides about 90% of their retirement income. Okay. And the average Social Security check is about uh, $1,470. Okay. So if you do that math backwards, you'd find that that is less than 150% for a single person of federal poverty level. Okay. So that they would qualify if they're in that area. And the way that I always ask that question is, do you make... Uh, uh, less than $1,200, uh, you know, a month. Uh, that sort of opens it up. Uh, either they uh, they do or they don't. Um, and the reason the $1,200 is because if they're getting a Social Security check and it was $1,200, I know that uh, unless they're on Medicaid, okay, 140 of that is going off to pay their Part B premium, right? So that's why I use that number to ask. So that would kind of, uh, you know, take us through uh, the, uh, uh, the the process of getting somebody signed up and uh, trying to get them in there. Okay, you can always email me if you have any questions at uh, I think that's training at hcpsales.com. I hope that you have um, found this uh, beneficial and useful. And I think it's a it's a great program. There's a lot of savings. Uh, if you can get somebody into this program, I mean, they are literally yours. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the savings is incredible. And you talk to if uh, somebody is living on that $1,200 a month and you suddenly put, I mean, another $100 a month worth of income back into their pocket. I mean, that's like getting a 10% raise. I mean, they will love you forever. Um, now, with that, again, like most programs, it's a two-edged sword. They can make a change every quarter. And unless you're working with them and keep in contact with them, uh, you know, the ex next agent that comes along can change that plan and put them into a different one. So you do want to be sure that you continue to, uh, you know, work with these people and, uh, and, and help them with these programs. Uh, this is a really a good one. And if you can... Uh, uh, you know, get them enrolled, like I said, uh, they'll love you forever and uh, you'll be able to, 
you know, keep them on your book, uh, and they will probably have friends that uh, are also in the same situation as they are, and uh, you'll be able to, you know, do more than just the one. So with that, I hope everybody uh, did get some benefit out of this, and um, I will see you next month where the topic is going to be a special needs plan. That'll be on February 19th. So good selling, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.